Today's episode of the Counseling Tutor Podcast is sponsored by Web Healer. You're a counselor in private practice and you need a website, or you've got an existing website which you need help with. Web Healer are offering Counseling Tutor Podcast listeners, that's you, £100 off the cost of a website design and build. Now, Web Healer specialize in websites for counselors and psychotherapists. It's what they do. And the Web Healer team provide a completely non technical, done for you solution, leaving you to focus your time on your clients. Operating for 20 years, Web Healer are a trusted resource amongst counselors when it comes to getting your practice online. So get the package details and claim your £100 off coupon for your new website by going to counselingtutor.com forward slash website. That's counselingtutor.com forward slash website. Hi, I'm Rory and welcome to episode 316 of the Counselling Tutor podcast. I am delighted to catch up again with Catherine Nibbs, who is a psychotherapist specialising in cyber trauma, a term she coined to describe the psychological impact of negative online experiences such as cyberbullying, harassment and exploitation. With a background in child and adolescent therapy, she has become a leading voice in exploring how digital environments affect mental health. Catherine also is a researcher, speaker and author known for integrating neuroscience and trauma-informed approaches into her work. She advocates for greater awareness of the psychological risks of online activity and works to provide guidance on protecting the mental well-being in a digital age. Today, Catherine will be discussing a specific type of online harm that may appear harmless at first, but can lead children into an abusive online relationship. So if you're going to do nothing else today, have a good listen to this interview and make sure you share it widely. And with that said, let's get on with today's episode. Welcome to the Counselling Tutor Podcast, the must-listen-to podcast for counsellors, psychotherapists and counselling students. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hello and a very warm welcome to the Counselling Tutor podcast from myself, Ken Kelly, and of course from Rory Lees Oaks. We're here together again for episode 316 of the Counselling Tutor podcast with three amazing topics, starting off with that ethical, sustainable practice where we continue our chat around neurodivergence. And today, really, what is neurodivergence? And we're really going to be diving into seeing the person not the label. We then move on to practice matters. That's the CPD section of uh, the Counseling Tutor podcast. You're going to enjoy it today. It's an interesting topic. We have uh, Catherine Nibbs, who is a regular uh, guest here on the Counseling Tutor podcast. Rory, met you met up with her, as you've beautifully said within the introduction, uh, an interesting topic of uh, innocent online interactions that can lead to abuse. Um, We're talking children and young people here, so an important topic. And and certainly before you brought this up, Rory, and we discussed it, it was outside of my awareness, and I'm very glad that you brought that up. So it's a must-listen today in uh, Practice Matters. And then, of course, we see you, our students. We move on to our student services. Such an important topic today. We're going to be talking about listening to understand, not listening to to respond so it's going to be a deep dive into active listening and I think whether you're qualified or a student this is an important topic and one that we should be revisiting often to check how our active listening is but let's start off with that uh, ethical sustainable practice Rory where we're speaking about what is neurodivergence and I guess with the slant on seeing past the label or the definition and recognizing that behind this is a person Absolutely, Ken. And I think you make a very, very good point, um, disc, you know, bringing that to awareness because people aren't a series of labels where things are stuck on. However, therapists need to understand the 
the kind of panoply of the human condition and how it might impact on an individual's life. Um, you know, we spoke in, in episode um, 315 about um, what neurodivergence is. So if you want to listen to that, go to counsellingtutor.com, the podcast tab, episode 315, and there's a lovely introduction here. But we're going to be talking about really the key insights. And w when people talk about neurodivergence, there is a there is a, a kind of uh, habit, if you like, of people thinking it only applies to people who are autistic or maybe people with ADHD. And the fact of the matter is it's an umbrella and it's the umbrella that encompasses a wide range of very personal experiences for clients. And I, I will give you some of the, some of the, the personal experience. It, it can be um, dyslexia. So, you know, people who are dyslexic are, um, by a modern definition, neurodivergent, um, ADHD. Um, and we could look at other things such as attention deficit hyperactivity, um, I'm going to try and drop the disorder from these, Ken. Uh, Thank you, I, 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 I don't think the disorders, are are, you know, being on the autism spectrum, although, although you know, the, the, the official name is autistic spectrum disorder, but we should really drop drop the disorder. Um, uh, dyspraxia, um, not being able to, you know, motor skills. Tourette's syndrome, where, where people have put maybe involuntary physical and vocal tics and sensory processing differences. So heightened and reduced, reduced sensitivity to sensory inputs as, as my dental hygienist will probably, uh, um, you know, will probably testify to because uh, I'm, I'm the worst patient when I have my teeth cleaned just because of that. So we need to think about that. And what we also need to think about, and I think this is really important is people can acquire neurodivergence. So what can happen is, is that, you might get people who um, are born neurodivergent and you might get people who've been in some form of accident or have maybe um, a brain tumour and they acquire it and, and they become neurodivergent by acquisition. So although we, we try not to label clients, having an understanding of the language allows us to get, I guess, closer to the language, get closer to the client, excuse me, and also be able to access their frame of reference. And that's what being a therapist is about, accessing someone's frame of reference and being able to see the world as they see it. I like that. It keys into that active listening that we're going to be diving into in student mm. services today because that's what it's all about. Um, it's it's an important topic. And you, you referred to last episode uh, 315 where we spoke about the language of, of how we speak about this, why it's important for us to be looking at this as counsellors, as psychotherapists at this time. And today, maybe that a little bit deeper dive. Um, the term neurodivergence coined by an Australian uh, uh, sociologist, and that's Judy Singer. And we've got a handout for you on this in the 1990s. And it refers to individuals who experience variations in brain function. So this is kind of a quote or a a, a, uh, a direct lift from, from how Judy described this, leading to difference in sociability, learning, attention, and mood regulation. As a neurodivergent man myself diagnosed uh, it's about seven years ago. I can definitely relate to a lot of those words. And this is the important one. Neurodivergence is not a medical disorder, but a natural variation within the human population. And it's for that reason that I think you're right, Rory, uh, the dropping of the D at the end of ADHD with the D being disorder, ASD, autism spectrum disorder. I think that language is is losing favour, as we mentioned last week, and, and, mm. and will be replaced. So at the risk of us having to re-record our podcast every couple of weeks, we're going to drop the word um, disorder. But let, let's talk about some of the core characteristics that um, – Character, characters and types of neurodivergence because neurodivergence as you've kind of mentioned encompasses a wide range of conditions and each affecting individuals differently and i think this is the main takeaway from what i've just said there wide range of conditions affecting individuals differently and what we don't want to be doing as we kind of dive into this topic is forming a picture or a label 
that we go, oh, that person is neurodivergent, therefore they are likely to think like this, act like this, experience these challenges. It is very, very varied uh, amongst individuals. And I guess that's why we say looking beyond the label and looking at the individual themselves. Um, and of, of course, just a very brief overview autism spectrum i'm not saying the d on there individuals no. on the autism spectrum often experience differences in social interaction communication sensory processing may have very specific interests may have not will always have and that's really important here you know there's a w one of the things that that came up for me when i kind of disclosed because it's kind of like coming out it, in fact it is coming out when i was mm. disclosed by all of my uh, 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 autism diagnosis i shared with certain uh, family members and they said well you can't be and then they started listening listing a whole load of traits that they saw in me that they did not that did not fit their label of autism so they said you can't be because x y and z so uh, one of them was that I, I worked for some time as a as an entertainer so i was quite happy standing up in front of a group of a thousand people and and entertaining them and holding them in the palm of my hand and they said you know uh, it, it, you can't be autistic because an, an autistic person is very shy and, and is not socially interacting with people. And of course, that was maybe true for, for some, but certainly not for myself. And I, I know if we look to the media, there are many um, autistic individuals that are, that, that are in the limelight, that are in the entertainment world, that are regularly speaking out on television to millions of people, uh, uh, at, at rock concerts to tens of thousands of people. Attention deficit hyperactivity uh, condition is characterized by inattention, impulsivity, hyperactivity, differing from societal norms. But again, there is a whole, I love the word spectrum, that sits with inside mm. the spectrum of, of where you might find yourself. And it may change from day to day. Um, dyslexia, that's something I can certainly relate to from my earliest years. I remember I was probably about four started uh, school in the United Kingdom at, at, at around about four. And I remember we started getting basic words that we had to look at. And for me, they just looked like weird patterns. And it was like everybody else had it. They were able to put these weird patterns in some kind of an order that, that said the cat sat on the mat. Me, I was just looking at these patterns going, what? is this and this learning challenge impacts reading writing spelling due to difference in how the brain processes that information dyspraxia i relate to that as well affects coordination motor skills leading difficulties in movement and planning i remember in my early years when when you had to hold the bean bag and walk across the little bar on the ground uh, I was the I couldn't do it. I kept on falling off. I can't stand on one leg to this day. I keep on falling over. Definitely dyspraxic in that area. Tourette syndrome, involuntary uh, physical or vocal tics, sensory processing different uh, differences. Individuals may have heightened or reduced sensitivity sensory in, to sensory inputs affecting their daily lives and functioning. So there's a very brief overview of what we might see in when we re refer to neurodivergence, but within there, there are literally millions and millions of people that might kind of I, I either be have a diagnosis or self-identify to any of those uh, uh, areas that we've covered under neurodivergence. But yet every single one of those person is unique, is different, and they are on their own journey. And that's the importance is that we see the individual not the diagnosis or not the neurodivergence first yet we still are respectful of neurodivergence in the way that we work rory well said ken but i was going to say bravo i was going to give you a round of applause for that <laughs> but it, it, it's very true and, and i'll just pick up on one of the things you said about being dyslexic i am i am dyslexic as well as all those people have written into me in the past telling me my spelling's awful will attest to and um i don't have any problem with reading i can read no problem at all. Um, but ask me to write anything. Well, when they say ask me to write anything down, ask me to use a pen and paper. And it's like my my right arm where I hold the pen is completely disconnected from my brain. I write things down. By the time I get to the end of a sentence, it looks like a, a spider's become very ill and walked through an ink pot. Um, and it, that was a challenge through my, my school life. And, you know, if you talk about Tourette's syndrome, what about this? Um, when, I, when I was given an assessment, 
my my wife said, well, I'm not really surprised. My, my, my lovely wife said, I'm not really surprised, Rory. She said, you know, when we were in our local town the other day, and I said, yes, yeah, shopping. She said, you were stood in, in the middle of a shopping centre. You were literally having a conversation with someone who wasn't there. And I said, was I? She said, you do it all the time. And when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, actually, I do. Sometimes I'm, I'm, I might be thinking about, thinking about a podcast um, and how I'm, going, how I'm going to, put that, you know, discuss the topics. And if I'm not careful, I can just get completely lost in that and start having a conversation with people. And, and of course, to those who are on the outside, this looks quite um, odd behaviour. Um, and that, I think, probably would fall under the, the panoply of Tourette's to some extent. So it, it is. And I, I think the challenge for therapists is, is to acknowledge and we, you know, last last week in three one five, we podcast three one five, we did talk about affirming. So, to acknowledge that people are different in the way that their 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 thinking and processing goes, but to see the person behind it, and also I think in some cases to acknowledge the difficulties it brings. Um, we, we're living in a more um, well, I use the word kinder society. Where where people, individual differences are now being, um, uh, there's, 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 the, the individual differences are seen as quite the norm, and people people are giving um, time and making adjustments for those individual differences. Um, but still, it can be a challenge, and you know I've worked with, I can think of at least a couple of clients who have struggled um, with either one or two different parts of neurodivergence because um, it wasn't particularly them, it was the people around them. And sometimes it's their family who, you know, say very, very um, thought thoughtless things to them, like, you know, you're a clumsy elf. You know, that's no good to someone who's dyspraxic Someone has difficulty with coordination, they knock the odd thing over. Calling someone a clumsy idiot or you you know, you're flipping, you know, you're flipping like a bull in a china shop isn't helpful because it's not something they can easily control if it can control at all. So yeah, I have worked on with an, before the term was even in my awareness with people who've struggled with um the way their 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 brains were wired up, I guess, for a different for, you know, to, to give it a good example. So just to have a therapist who understands that and, and uh, allows the space to talk about the challenge and what someone might want to do with it, I think is, is, is mightily helpful in therapy. So we don't have to give a label, but just give the space, listen, and understand that this is what it might be. Yeah. And, and, it, it's an interesting topic because we spoke last time about how it's kind of it almost like seems like it's emerging at the moment. It, it's coming into its own with more information being readily accessible, uh, with the, the world being a much smaller place where we can speak on social mm -hmm. media and we can identify with others and on their journey and have instant access to, to other people. But one, one thing that is interesting is looking to the statistics and there is an estimated 15 to 20 percent of the population that would fall into neurodivergence that we're speaking about right now and what i think and what the, the evidence is kind of pointing to is that is probably an underestimation mm. and, and and it is an underestimation due to undiagnosis in women so if we look back historically, this was uh, a, a, there was a time when women could not be diagnosed as neurodivergent. It, yeah. it just wasn't; they just weren't having it. It was a male-only thing. Uh, many many neurodivergent individuals may be unaware of their neurodivergent status. They may have not yep. seen that or recognised that. And I think these are important considerations for us as counsellors and psychotherapists. Um, we need to have a sensitivity to misdiagnosis. So a person who may not have, have recognized their own neurodivergent status may still have experienced pain and challenge within their lives that have taken them to professional healthcare professionals over the years. 
and they may have been misdiagnosed. Mm. In fact, there's a high incidence. The evidence points to a, a high incidence of um, uh, misdiagnosis with anxiety, depression, personality disorders. So having this information out for us as counsellors, knowing what to look for, what to be sensitive to, we can really aid somebody on their uh, path if it is done sensitively and of course as we said in three episode 315 and we're going to probably say it in each episode that we cover this topic we're not here to diagnose diagnosis is a very formal process and it's done by uh, uh, specialist individuals we as counselors and psychotherapists are not there to diagnose but we can signpost we can help support someone who's maybe going through a, a diagnosis and then of course if, if we do recognize that, that we are working with a client who is neurodivergent, it's about individual-centered approach. So there's no secret that Rory and I um, have a course that we built for Counseling Tutor uh, on working specifically with autism. And the reason autism is because this is an area that uh, Rory and I studied in. Uh, we did courses within this. Uh, we are neurodivergent ourselves, so we have our own uh, uh, journeys to kind of look at. But we also looked to what the resource says in building this, this training. And one of the sayings is, if you've met one autistic person... <laughs> Well, then you've met one autistic person because that's it. If you met me, and I'm very proudly autistic, um, and then you met Rory a few days later, we're very different people. We've got different interests. So we've got different ways of being. And the way our neurodivergence kind of shows in our life is different. So it's an individual-centered approach. It's tailoring the intervention to be unique and, and to the person's processing styles and sensory experiences. And it could include providing sensory accommodations or making, uh, it might be a quieter room or adjusting the lighting or changing our communication style to suit what is better for the client. And I think this is important that when we train in the area of neurodivergence, what we don't learn is a model that is going to fit all people. We learn what to look for in order to be able to offer an individual approach to to the people that are as unique as as people are and then of course we spoke last week about that inclusive language how important the language that we use is and how important it is to find what the lang preferred language is for the person that we're working with that if they if they are on a road of neurodivergent um, a diagnosis or they've been diagnosed how do they choose to own that themselves and these are just some considerations as we kind of go into this topic and of course we're going to cover it uh, for a number of weeks uh, mm. and we'll dive deeper and deeper as we go and kind of get a little bit more niche into some of the areas um, but I think we should end with some maybe some learning tasks, Rory. So learning tasks, and these are taken from the handout, and I'll tell you where to get the handout and the uh, in-depth article on what Rory and I are talking about in a moment. Reflect on your attitudes towards neurodivergent mm. individuals. If you take a moment and you think in your mind, what does an autistic person look like? How do they show up? What does that mean to you? And challenge that. Is that a stereotype? You know, when we yeah. when we look at when we're training, we learn about stereotypes and the danger of stereotyping that all Italians love pizza and anybody from Ireland loves drinking Guinness. You know, we move away from those stereotypes and we see people as individuals. So what does what does neurodivergence mean if you say it to yourself? And then maybe a learning a learning exercise might be consider what are some of the challenges that neurodivergent clients may face within your sessions? And how could this impact their needs and the way that you might react to that? That's a big ask. I think that that's a, that, for me, those kind of topics are a week of sitting and reflecting on them, Rory. And then maybe discuss experiences. If you've had experience in working with a neurodivergent client uh, or clients, um, discuss that maybe discuss it with your supervisor consider what strategies you worked with what what did you do that worked what did you do that you felt didn't work and then finally i guess in learning is think about the language 
What is the language you choose to use? If you're going to be writing on your website that you warmly welcome neurodivergent clients, have you trained in that? Do you understand it? Are you able to offer that? And then what is the language you might use to kind of bring that over? Any any final thoughts on this, Roy? Yes, I, I think that um, this is such an emerging cohort of, of clients that we're really only at the beginning of understanding um, what neurodivergence is. And I think that it's not, it's, it, it's, the learning isn't a one hit. So it's not, I've learned about that, now I know all about it. I think that in the next 10 years, in the next decade, we're going to see more research. You're absolutely right, Ken, we're going to find that more and more people um, are in fact neurodivergent. So I think my message would be, it's a continuing professional development. I know we, we rattle on about this on the podcast all the time, but really in the work we do, we have to do continuing professional development. So um, one of the things about the courses that, that we build is that anybody who goes on them um, has access to them for life. So if we get anything new, um, or any new research, we can actually add it in and people can come back to them. So it's not like going to a course where you get a load of handouts and that's it. It's it's a it's a living it's a living document, a living course where people can go back into and have a look and and look at anything that's that's been updated. And there will be updates and there will be changes and there'll be a continuing conversation um, because the the neurodivergent community is a is a wide broad church and and what we're not going to get is consensus on everything so i i think it it it's honest on us to keep informed keep our our learning up and and to realize that this is going to be something that's going to get a lot more prevalent in the years to come and something that every therapist is going to encounter beautifully said rory so as we kind of come to the end of this topic, there is uh, a number of uh, actions you can take. Number one is go to the show notes for today's episode. You go to counselingtutor.com, click on the podcast tab, find your way to episode 316. That's 316 right there within the show notes is going to be a link to a really nice in-depth article covering the topic Rory and I have spoken today. Within that article, there's an opportunity to download a handout. What is neurodivergence? It's what we've spoken about today, but it also has some really nice references at the end. So if you wanted to dig a little bit deeper, you can dig a little bit deeper into that topic. Secondly, um, on that handout are some learning activities. i covered them briefly it's uh, uh reflecting on your attitudes considering the challenges discussing experience working with neurodivergent clients and thinking about language where you kind of guided through those processes if you wanted to kind of do a little bit of your own cpd in your own reflection time that is in that handout it'll be very very useful for you and then thirdly we're speaking about uh, neurodivergence and and focusing specifically on autism um, and this is because we have done the learning, we looked to the research, and we've built training on this. If you're interested in our training course, I'm very delighted to say that the waiting list for this training course is now open. And you can join that by going to counselingtutor.com. Just go to counselingtutor.com. You'll be see very easily where our training is. It's right there on the home page. You'll be able to see that. And you're looking for the course Working Therapeutically with Autistic Clients. You can join that waiting list and it will download you the course handbook, which will give you all the modules and topics that are covered. You can have a look if that is for you. And then when the course goes live, we will send you an email if you're on that email or on that waiting list to say that it's gone live and you can make a decision of whether that fits into your um, current continuing professional development um, plans that you have for you within your practice. There it is. So that is, of course, uh, ethical, sustainable practice, a little bit of a deep dive into what is neurodivergence and seeing beyond that label. And I guess we're now we move into practice matters, the CPD section. 
I say that each week, but I'm actually realizing, Rory, the the, the whole the whole episode is CPD. The whole episode is CPD, yeah. isn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, well, I guess what we mean is that this is where we bring uh, people that are not Rory and not myself, Ken, in to speak about where they have a, an area of specialism or an expertise. Uh, and uh, a returning guest, Catherine Nibs. Uh, Rory, you met up with her on how seemingly innocent online interactions can lead to abuse of children and young people, a really serious topic uh, and something I wasn't aware of, Rory. Absolutely, Ken. And what I would say to those people who are listening out there, if you do one thing today, once you've listened to Catherine Nibbs' interview, share it with your colleagues, share it with anyone who has children, share it in, 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 in your, your professional social medias, because this is a real danger to children. I spoke with Catherine Nibs, who's a human technologist. She specializes in how the internet and the use of social media can impact on individuals. And what she is about to share with you in this interview is absolutely mind numbing and frightening. So fair warning, it does contain themes of an adult nature, nothing too scary, but just as a fair warning, have a listen to Catherine Nibs about how innocent online interactions can lead to child abuse. Practice Matters is proudly sponsored by the Counselor CPD Library. To access top quality, relevant continuing professional development for your practice that you can do at a time that suits you and all for less than the price of a cup of coffee, visit counsellingtutor.com. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back an old friend of the podcast and certainly a good friend of mine, Catherine Nibs, who's a human behaviour technologist, who's going to talk about um, a child protection issue that might have slipped under the radar. So if you are listening to this, it's really important you take note because this is so important. But Kath, it's delightful to see you, but... Just explain to us, what is a human behaviour technologist? So this is now a, uh, a new encompassing term that covers my work as a psychotherapist and author who's really at times pontificating, let's use that word because that is kind of what I'm doing, uh, really thinking about the way we use technology and why we use technology and that stems from um, all of the work around uh, psychology, psychotherapy and in a space of technology why we are all changing as human beings and of course that's really uh, what we're going to get into in terms of the conversation today but it's really about how and why we're now changing our behaviors in and around uh, the world of technology which includes those dreaded phrases smartphones social media and so on sending shivers down my spine Kath <laughs> um, and the reason for this podcast is I was I was looking I was looking at my LinkedIn profile and you were, you came on the timeline and th th you made a little video and the video said and I paraphrase here I cannot believe I had to explain to a social worker why someone, a stranger, requesting a picture of a child's feet was a child protection issue. And mm -hmm. I looked at that and I thought, we've got to know more about this. So what, what's going on? What's going on here? So, uh, so I think in all of the years that I've talked to you, Rory, I have moved from... Um, working primarily with children who are, might have been sent or, or appeared in my therapy office with lots of different issues. And I started to specialise in the space of uh, child sexual abuse uh, in the early 2010s and mm. 2011, that, that kind of era. And what happened from that time is I ended up in the space of what we now refer to as something called technology assisted or technology facilitated child sexual abuse. This is also known as um, online coercion. Uh, there's many, many names and many, many acronyms. And um, I'm literally, and, and I say literally just back from Slovenia and Croatia, um, this is a global issue that we are dealing with. And 
this particular issue when we talk about it today is one where, yes, the video does start with, I can't believe I've had to say to a social worker, but this is based on something that I uh, was dealing with in 2014. I then went on to write about it in my Sexual Harms uh, book, which came out in 2023. It's still an ongoing issue. And we're really talking about safeguarding thresholds, even though they're not often referred to as that, safeguarding thresholds that are currently being missed by professionals who work with children mm. in this space of online facilitated coercive um, child sexual abuse. Yeah, yeah. So on the, on the, on the, on the face of it, um, you know, a child speaking to a professional and saying, oh, you know, someone's asked for a picture of my feet or my hands may seem innocuous, mm -hmm. may seem... Mm -hmm. Um, not to switch on the alarm bell. Someone says, want to, a picture of me uh, declothed with no clothes on, immediate alarm bell's going off. But pictures of hands and feet, they seem on the face of it so innocuous. But what is going on there? What, what, why should professionals who work with children, and indeed parents, I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of parents listening to this, be mm -hmm. worried about this? So let's, let's address what you talked about there in terms of... Um, Currently, in the in the space of education at the moment, we are really saying to children, do not share nude images, okay? Now, nudes are quite easy to understand exactly what they are. And what we generally do is we'll use analogies such as the swimsuit area. Don't share pictures where you might wear a swimsuit. And of course, depending on the kind of swimsuit, whether it's trunks or a swimming costume or a tankini, it, that can be a confusing way to describe things mm. to children anyway. But what we're effectively talking here about feet is images that are not illegal to send. Now, a child sexual abuse image is any image that uh, is classified as um, sexually um, uh, uh, sexually present. Um, I'm trying to be very careful how I say this because it can be really scary. The nomenclature can be really confusing for people. So what I want to say is <clears throat> anybody under the age of 18 that shares images of their genitalia or for for females, their breasts... That is classified as child sexual abuse imagery, and that is absolutely illegal to send. It is illegal to ask for. It is illegal to take a picture of yourself in that way. Mm. And we we are in a society where there are certain um, platform applications that allow for the sharing of these images, which we often refer to as intimate images. Mm. Now, the thing about feet and hands and elbows and necks and ears and all the other areas that... We we might classify as non-sexual, they are not illegal to take or send or um, have on your own phone. But what really, uh, uh, so what the video pertains to, and it's on all my social media channels in terms of the way that I'm trying to educate people around this, it's normally asked for, for a coercive reason. And I call that video the feet pick pipeline and in this instance the young people are generally well aware of what they've been asked to send you know it's a picture of feet they're often given a monetary reward so of course what child wouldn't want to get a monetary reward for sending something that isn't breaking the law mm. and it isn't if you follow the law or rules of sending nudes i'm not sending a nude therefore i'm not let's do the air quotes doing anything wrong However, what happens with the perpetrators of crimes against children is often that's the first image that then becomes the leverage for something we call sextortion. And sextortion is blackmail around sexual abuse imagery. And what can happen in terms of, let's talk a, a psychological process here, that in the first instance, the child is empowered, they send an image of their feet, they feel like they are in control, and at the point of sending the image, the power play changes and the perpetrator now holds the power by being able to say, send me some more or send me some pictures that are further up the leg. And that means they can start to um, gain money for the, the transaction. 
but the power play is in the hands of the perpetrator who will ask for more and more explicit images and that starts to take us into a conversation about the conferences I've just been around and I think it's important Rory that we talk about some figures and I think the best way to explain this is is figures that are collected by an organisation called the National Centre for Exploited and Missing Children, known as NECMEC, over in uh, the US. And they are the organisation that gets the reports from uh, tech industries and sometimes direct from children. And the numbers of reports that they received uh, last year were in the region of 32,000 reports and those reports are often of more than one image or uh, video often they relate to websites and it totaled somewhere in the region of 800,000 images that were collected last year as reports and of course that's not every image that's reported so when we start to think about these figures we are in a very very scary landscape i understand this and when i talk about this in these terms it's it's likely to make uh, uh it's likely to be heard in a way that goes oh my goodness that's absolutely irresponsible of technology and irresponsible of children to be sending these images i want to emphasize more often than not it is a coercion it is a coercive type of relationship where these images uh, are requested and sent and unfortunately, we also live in a world where intimate images are then shared non-consensually. Mm. So images are being traded, they are being stored, shared, sold, uh, used like Pokemon cards often. And the reason they are collected in this particular way is because there is a large demand for this of perpetrators of crimes against children of sexual abuse imagery. So just hearing those figures, this is this is grooming on an industrial scale, sophisticated, yeah. yes, well uh, rehearsed. Uh, I'm going to use the the word thoughtfully, well executed. In other words, you know, there's a, there's a process for doing this, and and part of that mm -hmm. process is acclimatization by degree. It starts off with something innocuous like feet or hands, and then as you say, the power switches over to the perpetrator. And of, of course, if there's a monetary reward involved in this, then um, you know that that can be um, that can be used as an inducement to to ask for other more inappropriate images and worse, I would yeah. imagine. And and also to influence um, said children to recruit others. So now we're talking about, so I, I often, when I'm talking to children, when I talk in, in this space, this is a business model. This is about mm. recruitment of as many participants as possible. And, you know, we are we are in a time and space where images are now being um, utilised by AI systems. So actually even the provision of an image with a full set of clothes on, can be undressed by AI and there is currently a, a huge issue with this in South Korea so there's been a um, uh, and, and I have a, a social media video around that one as well uh, we, we now exist in a time when you don't even need to share images like this anymore it can actually be done via an AI app that can undress you so if we think about the reasoning behind this it can often be revenge done for a laugh, um, sent because somebody won't send an image. And it's 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 a real it's a real space we have to think about, particularly as child practitioners, as parents, are we having conversations about the conversations that children engage with with mm. people online? So it's not always about are you sending nude images? It's not even about has anybody ever asked for a picture of your feet? It's has anybody ever asked for an image that you're uncomfortable about? Have you ever been threatened that somebody would share an image? Do these conversations take place? And yes, they, they are taking place, Rory, as you've said, on an industrial scale. There are books being sold by perpetrators on how to do this. And this space at the minute of sextortion is 
uh, and has very, very sadly resulted in a number of children taking their own lives because the shame around this particular issue is so deeply, uh, deeply held and the wound is so is so quickly created. Mm. And this is this is a time of crisis on one hand. But it's also a time of us understanding the issue so we can begin to ask the questions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we hear that. I mean, I'm hearing that loud and clear. And I guess one of the confounding things about this is that in the mainstream, we've, you know, the mainstream media has recently reported that the actor, I believe she's now an actor and, and singer, Lily Allen, has an OnlyFans mm-hmm. page where she's selling images of her feet. Uh, uh, to people who mm-hmm. might, you know, just have a kinker around that. I mean, we're not trying to um, demonise the any, anybody who has a particular interest in feet. Um, but it, the, the, yeah. I guess what, what strikes me is that the spirit of the age where people can monetize parts of their body and do well with it, then then is picked up by young people. I am sure yes. there'll be, I'm sure there'll be lots of young women and we talk about women but this could primarily this could affect young boys as well young young men as well and i'm sure that someone thought well you know lily allen's selling pictures of her feet why can't i do that um uh, yeah yeah and and in most cases until you start to go through puberty feet are genderless oh yeah it's a good point yeah they only, they only become defined as you develop into into an adult i guess yeah yeah well, I mean, I will say that, you know, that hairs on the toes doesn't necessarily define uh, what gender you are anyway, but it's, it's more, <laughs> moreover, as, apart from the size of feet, yeah, there, and I'm not into shaming kink, so this has been certainly on the Instagram page, I've had some really good conversations yeah. um, where people have said, you know, this is this is monetization by children. So on the, the, on the scale of it, it sounds like it's um, adults exploiting children, but what you've just talked about there are there are some um, young children, and this was the conversation that I, I talked about in the book, is the child who I worked with who was selling her images at, at the beginning, her feet images, was doing it for monetary gain and was completely aware as to what would happen after the images had been sent. And I'm going to leave it there for people yes. to use that use Join their the imagination. Dots. Join in the quotes. dots, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's an, that's another difficulty, isn't it? And I think it's a good time to remind ourselves um, because, goodness gracious, we've 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 had to have this this conversation so many times. We've discussed it so many times. Mm. Children cannot consent to their own abuse, and I think yeah. I think I think in the past, hearing hearing you speak about that, somebody might say, "Well, they know what they're doing. You know, they know what they're doing." No, that's completely mm-hmm. wrong. Children mm-hmm. cannot consent to their own abuse. And, um, and and I think that mindset really needs to be concreted in because I think sometimes in the conversations I've had, not with therapists, but, you know, in, in a general conversation, it might come up. Yeah. It's amazing how many people still believe in the idea that, that children can, can consent. And, it, yeah. and, and, of course, then that becomes somehow their fault when it all yes. goes wrong, there's a there's a blaming yeah. culture there. Well, you did it. You know what you were doing. You were charging money. What do you expect? But that isn't that's not right, is it? Absolutely not. And certainly, this is the thing, um, uh, really, that I've been in, or I am in this space around at the moment, is talking around um, children's development, understanding children, and also the kinds of cyber traumas that they uh, they have when this occurs because generally we would, in these instances, victim blame mm. in terms of... Uh, because we're trying to find a way to deal with the issue and more often than not, the way that we deal with the issue at the minute is through lack of understanding, which, you know, this is why we're having this conversation. Yeah. Uh, and and in terms of kind of the counsellors and psychotherapists that are listening, what questions are, you know, flying through your mind at the minute about what you can ask young people people in your therapy practice that will take you into this space and then what do you know about the actions that you are um, uh, going to follow required to follow need to follow or should follow given 
the lack of understanding around uh, sexual based issues or cyber based issues to, to date at the minute, because this is, you know, as I've as I've alluded to the crisis of our time and very little is known about it outside of um, maybe police services. But again, when we're talking about pictures of feet, it wouldn't. It wouldn't actually create... I mean, think about trying to make a safeguarding referral to social care direct and picking up the phone and saying, hi, I've got um, little Amy. Um, she's been sending pictures of her feet. Mm. Unless you know who the other person is or what was requested or... It, it sounds innocuous, doesn't it? Pictures of her feet. Well, what's the problem? Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, um, I suspect those 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 heinous people who carry out this type of activity in the dark corners of the internet know exactly um know exactly that would be the response from a lot of people so mm -hmm. just as a call to action just for those people they may be they may be parents they may be people engaged in child protection they may be just lay people who've just stumbled across the podcast and, and, <laughs> and come yeah. across this and if you have you're very welcome or or if you're a, a practitioner working with children what do we have to do what what do we have to be aware of? What do we have to do if we believe that this is a thing? And it's also, that's two questions. You never do two questions as an interviewer. But the second question is, how do we educate young people? So the first question is, what do professionals do or parents do to equip themselves to be aware of um, this phenomenon? So, again, there's there's little training around pictures of the feet pick pipeline there are and there is plenty of uh, sites that you can visit around um, what's commonly referred to as TASCA within the United Kingdom that's the technology assisted child sexual abuse um, so one of the organizations I work with and I really uh, I really do appreciate their work is the Marie Collins Foundation and um, I've worked with them for some time um, in terms of um, helping them with the resources but they have a brand new um free to download for any kind of issue resources uh list uh that you can go to their website for so if you're working with a child who might have shared one of their images bearing in mind you need to understand the route with which you can help children protect themselves so i'm going to suggest that you really pop down whether it's on your phone or on your notes or wherever there is a tool in the United Kingdom called Report Remove, or there is a global one called Take It Down. And Take It Down is a service that allows children themselves to report an image that is um, of this ilk. Generally, they tend to be sexual ones. And no information about the child is taken, no personal information about the child is taken. It is literally to take that image and get what's called a, a hash on it because the hash prevents that image from being uploaded to social media channels, okay? Mm. So it really is, um, this this technology is absolutely phenomenal, uh, uh, Rory, in terms of being able to put a unique identifier onto an image so that it cannot be uploaded in terms of on social media sites. Um, the same with Report Remove, that will also do it um, the same in terms of these lists that they provide to social media companies. Um, I could get geeky on the technology, but I won't. I would certainly say there are websites for if you believe the child you're working with has potential harmful sexual behaviour. So that would be through organisations like the Lucy Faithful Foundation. And if you are looking for um, knowledge, assistance, conversations with law enforcement, you can have a look at CEOP, you can have a look at the NSPCC website, you can look at Childnet, you can look at Internet Matters, Get Safe Online. There are lots of internet safety companies that will give you advice about routes of action, things you can do. But as a psychotherapist, I can tell you now, aside from the, the books that I've been writing, there is no literature on this to date. Mm. There might be small amounts of um, research articles, but really we're in a phase where this isn't part of a standard child training route to understand all of the issues that exist online. But it is listed in Working Together to Protect uh, Children. So this is Working Together 2023. It was also in 2018 that forms of abuse that, that we uh, report 
that take place in the real world also exist online, such as viewing pornography, um, sexual abuse and sexual images, intimate image sharing, intimate image abuse. And yet there is still no direct legislation or anything for us to do as, as practitioners. So it's a complicated space. I would certainly say verse yourself in as much information as you can about internet related issues and really start to understand the social media platforms such as snap which is uh what the children call it you will know it as snapchat as a grown-up adult because that's the way that it's talked about by children learning what discord is learning where files and uh can be shared on the apps and the kinds of ways in which information is shared and disappears etc cetera, etc cetera. but also talking to children about what they have on their phone who do they talk to what apps do they use and thinking about it in a way that any child under the age of 13 should not be on any social media platform because that's against data protection but we know that children do use those platforms they might be old enough to use roblox for example there might be seven or eight and the parents have allowed them on roblox but actually these conversations take place on uh, gaming systems like that so yeah. really getting yourself versed in technology the spaces children use and no you won't break it and if you don't sign up as a nine or 14 year old child you will not come across um disinformation so you know don't sign yourself up as a 10 year old child on roblox because that's just a bit weird and probably would get you into trouble but certainly go and use the platforms go and have a look at where it is the children are uh, going yeah. in terms of online and and learn about the systems yeah and it's, it's it's just the sort of things that my parents would do when i was a kid we didn't have the internet but people would find out where we're hanging around and what we we're mm -hmm. doing and mm -hmm. you know you're at the corner shop you're trying to you're the people trying to buy you know uh, cider underage and and yeah. you know and people would look out and people would say things so yeah. i think that's 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 really useful uh, Kath has mentioned a lot of um resources and what we're going to do this is so important i'm going to put links into the show notes page so if you go to counselingtutor.com you'll see the podcast if you go down to episode 316 um, you'll see within the podcast uh, show notes there's a there's going to be some links that that you can go to and I, I would i would say please 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 share this podcast as widely as you can to parents to um you know to professionals to other mm -hmm. therapists because this is the thing that as you say kath it went under my radar and until if i hadn't have stumbled upon your linkedin post it, it would have never come to the surface so let's mm -hmm. let's get some awareness and i guess it just goes for me to say kath nibs thank you so much for the work you do and thank you for joining us wow a really sobering mm -hmm. Um, interview there, Rory. Thank you very much to Catherine Nibs for returning, sharing the knowledge uh, with us. Um, and thank you to you as always, Rory. You, you, you're holding those important discussions and, and, and bringing, bringing us the experts in the field that change perhaps how we look and act mm. within our practice. So that is Practice Matters and we back out of Practice Matters and we now Look to our future counsellors and psychotherapists. Yes, you, the students. You're on your formal studies to become a counsellor or a psychotherapist. And we recognise you with Student Services. Student Services is sponsored by Counselling Skills Academy. Can't tell you how many times Rory and I have heard counselling students say that learning skills and knowing that they're using them effectively is really, really challenging. The reason for this is because we don't get to see another counsellor using skills in a real live session. In reality, this means that we're asked to learn something that we can never see demonstrated in a real setting. And it's no wonder that many of us are left feeling unsure. If you want to see counselling skills used in real sessions by qualified therapists, so this is real sessions, real presentations and real use of skills, then go to counsellingskillsacademy.com. There's some free videos on skills, including a full live session that you can have a look at. Gain the competence 
and the confidence of knowing you're using your counselling skills effectively. Just visit counsellingskillsacademy.com. And today in Student Services, listening to understand, not listening to respond. What do we mean by that, Rory? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I think what we mean by that is that it's how we are taught from very young children to listen and respond. If you look at your, if you've got children, if you look at your child's English um, English literature specifications or the things they learn, they, they talk about listening and responding. And what we're not taught is listening to understand. So if you're listening to respond, um, you're you're listening so that you can gain information to put a response. So politicians are terribly good at this. If anybody who listens to Question Time, that's the that's here in the UK where the leaders of the the opposition and the, the government debate uh, matters of the day. It's usually done on a Tuesday morning in in the UK. Here, you'll find that that um, there's lots of listening to respond. So someone will put something to the prime minister and the prime minister will say aha well you know you're saying that but actually there's this 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 and this there is no listening to understand in other words that gap where people go i could actually see what you where you're coming from here and it speaks to empathy we're we're taught from very young children i'm sure they're doing a great job in schools i don't want to give schools a hard time or teachers a hard time but we're taught to respond. In other words, we're taught to give answers to questions as opposed to looking a little deep, listen, looking at the music behind the words and maybe connecting the emotion of what's said to, to how we respond to someone. And I think it's a big challenge for uh, counselling students, especially if you're going in level two uh, or, or entry levels, being respectful to our, our friends in, in Scotland. They have a slightly different um, qualification level in Scotland. Um, but if you're going into your first training, you know, your introduction course, um, what I used to hear and what I did myself as a student was listening to responding. You know, in other words, I'd be giving solutions and answers and, and um, rescuing as opposed to actually listening to understand, listening to try to gain a real understanding of where this person is coming from. And I think the the best listeners and the, the you know, if anybody's doing any leading, uh, you know, if you're leading, you've got a team, the best, the best listeners are those are who listen to understand, not to respond, not to give solutions straight away to try and understand where the person's coming from. And, um, it can be a bit of a challenge because our society values listening to respond, I think, a little bit more than listening to understand. Yeah. Well, you're 100% right. You know, it's <clears throat> so often if somebody is speaking, what's really happening is we're relating what they're saying to our lives, our experiences, how that uh, impact something that we've maybe experienced or some advice that we could give and it's as you say it's not active listening it's it's listening to respond and very often quite early in the uh the interaction so the person is talking and they might say a paragraph of sentences but quite often by the end of the first sentence listening has stopped because the person the, the the person who is listening to respond is just waiting for the gap to jump mm. in and say how that relates to them or what that person should do or ask them have they tried this or have they tried that as opposed to listening to each and every single word, word of the person. Now, if you can see this within yourself, uh, then that's okay because it's pretty normal um, and active listening is it's like a muscle, you know, we need to, to flex it, we need to work it, we need to work on it to be able to actively listen. We'll give you some exercises as we come to the end of this that you can use to, uh, to flex your active listening muscle, to listen, to understand rather than to listen to respond. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it's very, very rare. Yet, and this is so important, if you think of a qualified counsellor or psychotherapist, up to 90%, listen to that number, up to 90% of a counselling session 
can be spent actively listening. And that active listening can be incredibly therapeutic without responding, without saying a word, just actively listening. Because in the way that we say that it is rare in the world that we might actively listen, that means that it's rare that people are truly listened to, that they are truly heard for everything that they bring, the wholeness of their person, the wholeness of that individual. And uh, I looked to Carl Rogers, A Way of Being, that's Houghton Miffin, uh, 1980, page 116. It says, active listening means seeing the entire presentation of the speaker. So we're talking not just about the words that that person is saying. We're looking further than that. We're, we are listening to the tone of their voice. We're looking to see if there's anything that shows within their body language. Are they clenching their jaw, for example, or wringing their hands? How are their shoulders placed when they're sitting within that chair? That's all part of, of them messaging to us because, of course, body language is uh, so, so important. And then, of course, we have um, the posture, uh, eye contact, and their gaze, where are they looking? Are they looking at you? Are they looking away? So much of how the client is within the room is part of that active listening, really taking in the wholeness of this client and truly, truly being there. And I think it all comes together beautifully, Rory, by this quote by Carl Rogers. When I've been listened to and when I've been heard, I'm able to re-perceive my world in a new way, and go on. The man himself, Carl Rogers. Yeah, he, he just has a way of, he just has a way of putting it into perspective, Carl Rogers, <laughs> doesn't he? And yeah. I mean, he really does, you know. And, I, I, you know, I rattle on about this seemingly week on week, but, you know, the curative factor in, in therapy, it's, it's, it's been kind of known for a long time, is the, is the relationship between the client and the counsellor. If it's a good relationship, trusting relationship, one that's boundaried and con contracted um, and the client understands the limits of confidentiality, then, you know, then the client can speak about those things. They can't speak about anything else. You can't speak to anyone else about. And you're right, Rogers was absolutely right. It's that he, he, what he's talking about is that taking that load off your back putting that heavy bag down of the difficulties you've been carrying and letting for a time someone else carry it for you or sh at least sharing the load. And um, it, it, that listening to understand is it keys so much into that because as humans, we all want to be understood. You, you hear it now, don't you? I really like that person because they get me. That's, that's kind of come into the language, hasn't it? Someone gets me. And what someone really means is, they understand who I am. You know, they understand my little idiosyncrasies, that my ways of being, the way I am, and they accept me for that. They get me. And that is the secret of listening to understand. It's it's about it's about the, the person being listened to, feeling validated, and feeling like, quite frankly, someone cares. Oh yes. Um, and nothing says I care more than really truly listening and being there for mm. that person and um three things we'd like to leave you with as we come near the end of this topic the first is you, you know that if you listen to the podcast often that student services is sponsored by counseling skills academy.com that's a little side project of mine and it's because I love counselling skills and I believe that once that door closes, you know, all the theory and everything stays outside and you're in there with a the client and all that you have is, is, is your skills, whether you're working online or whether you're in, in person with the, per, with the, the client. And um, I've made a, a lesson from Counselling Skills Academy available for free for all our podcast listeners. Um, you can get it in the show notes or just go to counsellingskillsacademy.com and it's right there on the home page. And it is a video on active listening. It's a little lecture on, it's only eight minutes on active listening. But what makes it special is there's then a three-minute demonstration of active 
listening. Now, Rory, where have you seen that before? Where have you seen a demonstration of active listening on a video? We think that that's something we do with the ears, but it's there for you. So if you want that, go to counsellingskillsacademy.com. Just scroll down on that screen. You'll see it's there. You just click on it, put your, put your email address that you want that uh, uh, lecture sent to, and we'll send it through to you. So that's the one thing. The next thing is I wanted to share with you uh, SOLA, S-O-L-E-R. It's a little acronym that you can use for active listening, specifically in counselling. And the S in SOLA is sit facing the person. So nothing says I'm listening to you and I'm receptive to what you have to say than, than actually your posturing towards that person. O of SOLA. So you've got the sit facing, the S. The O is open your body position be aware am i guarding am i folding my hands is there anything that is blocking me from this client and if you're working on light online that might be a microphone have you got a big microphone in the way of you and the client mm. if you watch uh, any of our podcast videos that i know charlie puts out on social you'll see we got big microphones <laughs> in front of us but i wouldn't work with this microphone if i was working with a client because it closes no. my my body position it's it's a guard between us so that's the s and the o the l is lean forward to some extent be careful with this one you don't want to overdo it but you want your posturing to be open and leading leaning slightly towards it shows a receptiveness to the person the e is for eye contact but there's an important caveat with eye contact it is eye contact where appropriate eye contact is mm. not always appropriate we said that part of um, active listening is seeing the whole of the person and part of that is where is their eyes so if they're looking to us then of course we're going to make eye contact if they're purposely avoiding eye contact with us then we can do the same and only occasionally touch eye contact when it feels m appropriate and the r in sola i love it's relax and just be yeah. comfortable within it because we can't really be active lis actively listening if I'm going right, the S is uh, I've got to sit facing them and I've got an open body yeah. position and I've got to lean forward a bit. You know, if we're thinking about how we're positioning ourselves, how we're posturing ourselves, what skill we might use next, then we're not actively listening. <laughs> we're we're no. then ready to we're, we're we're ready to respond as opposed to just listening to that person in their entirety. So, what can you do? You can go to counsellingskillsacademy.com. You can go and get that, that free lecture on that and see a demonstration of active listening um, within our show notes, counsellingtutor.com. Click on the podcast tab. Go to episode 316. Uh, all the links will be there, including the link to an article on uh, listening that we've covered today. Uh, and then want to end with how can you practice your uh, active listening any interaction where somebody is speaking to you you have an opportunity to actively listen next time you're at the store instead of going through the checkout where you self check out go to a real person and as they're checking you out saying how's your day today and really listen to what they say when somebody speaks to you give it a try and see how often you really actively listen if you make it a mindful activity and uh, a great way of kind of bringing that together and crystallizing it is journal about it journal about the interactions you had within the day you know i can have interactions and i can say you know i was speaking to my wife today but i noticed that for maybe 80 percent of that i wasn't actually there i wasn't actively listening the whole time it's okay it's okay. I'm not punishing myself. I'm just recognizing it. I might have another interaction where I can say, wow, I was really connected with that person, really felt that I was absorbing what they were saying. And I, I feel that I really, truly heard them. What was the difference in how I was within those two interactions? That's great stuff for a journal, that is. It really is, Rory. Absolutely. And maybe just reflects on how you've been listened to. Um, you know, are you listened to regular basis? Do people listen to understand you or are they just busy tapping their mobile phones or mm. or, or looking at their watches or, or or making you feel like you're a little bit of a mild inconvenience you know I, I think certainly in our house we we have times where we will sit and listen so we, we you know both my, myself and my wife live busy lives but we will come together 
to sit and and put time aside to listen to each other's uh, you know concerns or worries or or anything really and we found we found that works you know it, it, it it's a it's a it's a bit like it's not like a therapy session although it can feel therapeutic but <laughs> just to set the time just to set the time aside yeah and um you know switch your phone off make sure there's no one knocking at the door and just spend some time trying to understand the other person's point of view and uh you know and i think i think it's well worth doing and it's it's a great feeling um to be listened to you know i've never met anybody who's been really listened to who's come away not feeling at least at least validated or or you don't have to feel better but at least validated and understood it's a great thing for a human being to feel i'm gonna say it one last time quote from carl rogers when i've been listened to and when I've been heard, I'm able to re-perceive my world in a new way and go on. This has been episode 316 of the Counseling Tutor podcast. The National Counseling and Psychotherapy Society, or NCPS, proudly sponsor this podcast, supporting students every step of the way. Join the NCPS for resources, training, and a friendly, knowledgeable community to enhance your learning experience. Visit ncps.com. Yes, we started off in ethical, sustainable practice, and we talked about what is neurodivergence we talked about the panoply of presentations that can inform neurodivergence and we've dropped the disorder and we also mentioned that um once you once you've met one neurodivergent person you've met one neurodivergent person we're a wide group of people all very different and we should be treated in that way we should be treated as individuals not a diagnosis and if you want a handout from that if you go to uh, counseling tutor podcast uh, go to counselingtutor.com go to episode uh, go to the podcast tab <laughs> um find episode 316 you can download the handout and there's lots more information there in practice matters i talked to my good friend and quite frankly quite a genius in this field Catherine nibs um talking about how seemingly innocent online interactions can lead to child abuse as I said in the introduction, make sure you share that widely. Make sure that your your colleagues, your peers, anybody hears that because it is so important. And as you hear in the interview, something that is literally going under the radar. So we need to raise awareness of that. So please share it widely. And then in student services, Ken and myself talked about listening to understand, not listening to respond making sure that the person who speaks to you is understood and validated and before we leave today if you're listening on one of the podcast apps be that itunes or Podchaser, why not leave us a review kind of myself love a nice review and uh, that would that would be that would be lovely so my plea to you today is why not give us um a little review and tell us what you think of uh, of our efforts today and as always stay grounded and stay safe. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. Counselling Study Resource, or CSR for short, is the world's most comprehensive assignment guidance and study support resource for students just like you of counselling and psychotherapy. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counseling Tutor Podcast. Find the show notes for this episode by visiting counsellingtutor.com.